So today, I want to take up the topic of the church. And I want to begin with my glasses. Uh, uh, let's, let's, let's do a little role play. Let's assume you've got a friend out of town. And uh, the friend knows you attend the church here. Uh, your friend is not a churchgoer. And your friend wants to know um, a couple things about the church. The first is, this friend is asking you to tell, tell him or her what is important to you about this faith community, the one you attend. Uh, and you're going to write a letter back to them. What? There are no right or wrong answers here, folks. Okay? It's, it's what is important to you about this place um, that that brings you? What are some of the things? Feel love. Feel love. We welcome all. Welcome all. Okay. <laughs> this is a big thing. Okay. Welcome. Okay. What else? Feels like a home place? Holy. Holy place. Okay, good. I like that one better. <laughs> what else? Mary, I, you probably talk. <laughs> Mary Hall, Mary Hall had her hand up first. Just, I come back right to you. Mary Hall. If I can compare this to a bar, it reminded me of the Cheers theme where everybody knows your name. Everybody knows. We're not going to get, let that get out that we compare this place to a bar, okay? <laughs> we're, going, we're going to keep that down home, all right? Everybody knows your name. I love that. I don't think Cheers is the typical bar. <laughs> okay. If I was a wise guy, I tell people to preach and come to it. Well, that, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's important. To my family. What else? Yes, Leo. Feel God's presence. Yep. Feel God's presence. Okay. I'm going to put down my symbol for God. You wouldn't know what that is. All right. What else? Fellowship. Fellowship. Okay. All right. Who else? Who else got that? Music. Ah, music. There you go. Put another adjective on there. Beautiful. Inspiring, maybe? Yeah. That, that's just what I was thinking. <laughs> Inspiring you. I know what you think. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. What else? Uh, multi generational. All right. Love that. Okay. Anybody else? Now, your friend has a second question. You're going to address this in the same letter. What could be done to improve? Faith community. Um, if, if, if the answer is a new priest, that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, what, what are your ideas and thoughts here? And it's, by the way, if 
improvement doesn't necessarily mean criticism, folks. Okay? I got ideas, but I want to hear yours. More involvement in leadership or volunteers? Or volunteers, okay. And we're not talking about football here. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Or five stars. More five stars. <laughs> More balls. <laughs> Too easy. <laughs> what else? Really? Yo, LL, there you go. More children. More children, okay.
it's, it, is, it is a community that is bound together because of commitment among the members. And we, we've all heard about Paul's concern for building up within the church, building up by way of mutual exhortation and example. That's one example of what Paul says. Paul, knowing that these ecclesia, these churches, are intentional uh, intentional communities knows that they can fall apart. When people be, when people lose their commitment, they fall apart. The family's a family. Now it can it can certainly have be frayed at the edges, but it's only the commitment that holds the people together within the collegiate. So I talked about Paul's metaphors for the church, because it reveals something about his vision. Uh, agricultural this is in 1 Corinthians. Paul says, I planted Apollo's water, but God gave the growth. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and each will receive wages according to their own labor. For we are God's co-workers working together. You are God's field, God's building. Notice that in this metaphor, the church is a living thing. It is a growing thing. And it is a thing that in order for it to thrive, needs tending. It needs maintenance. It needs nurturing. It needs love. Just like, just like a garden. You can't plant a garden and then let it go. It needs to be tended. Um, finally, here, Paul makes it very clear that, that God's role in the ecclesia, in the community, God's involvement is foundational. Uh, and that God depends on us to do our part. Now I'm tempted to say it's a symbiotic relationship, but one is in the symbiotic relationship, one side is dependent on the other. other. And I like I like how uh, my mentor and, and priest here, John Claypool, used to say this. God looks to our involvement and requires our involvement. And so John would say, without God, we cannot. Without us, God will not. We can't do it without God. God can do it without us, but God chooses to require our cooperation. In many, many things, by the way, but certainly with respect to the, the planting, the nurturing, the growing of a church, of a, of a, of a community, of an ecclesia. So that's the first of Paul's methods. The second is family. And we see a couple of uh, references to Romans here. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. I feel myself confident about you, my brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. Now, as an aside, I wanted to crop it out. I wanted to just leave it out, but I couldn't do it uh, intellectually, honestly. Uh, when I see the whom he foreknew, he also predestined uh, that. Uh, I've got issues with that. <laughs> Call on Steve Major if you need <laughs> I got real issues with that. But that's not what we're talking about here. So if we want to have that discussion, we can have that discussion. But it's going to be on another day and another time. The point here is uh, we have son, the firstborn within a large family. We're talking here about the metaphor of a family. Uh, and then, brother, again, here, brothers and sisters instructing one another. Uh, so what do, we, what do we think about when we think about family dynamics? What do y'all think? What's the, all right, let's, what's the good in family dynamics? Love and support. 
Love and support. Okay. What else? Loyalty. Loyalty. Thank you. What else? Tight knit. Uh, ties that bind even when there's a conflict, all that. Yes, but. There's also the bad side about family. When you think of bad in, in family dynamics, what do you think? Conflict, rivalry, rivalry, competition. Sorry, competition. Yeah, pretty much the opposite of what we said about the good, right? There's, you know, every family, there's a, you know, every good functioning family, there's a dysfunctional family. And frankly, also there's this. For every family, there's Uncle Louie. Right? <laughs> Every family's got that guy, Uncle Louie. Uh, the other thing about the other thing about family, and this is particularly true, uh, problematic in terms of using uh, family dynamics, if you will, a metaphor for the church or a metaphor for relationship with God, is is um, is so many people. <laughs> have had traumatic, you know, God the Father, that phrase is traumatic to many people uh, because they either had uh, abusive parents uh, or absent parents, uh, but that, that, that raises the specter of, of really um, almost a post-traumatic kind of situation. So we have to be careful about that. Um, the other, the other, the other concern, I, you know, and, and this, this is, uh, well, I get this in a minute, but this is not Paul's favorite metaphor by any by any means. The other problem is, uh, we talked about the ecclesia being an intentional community, and the family is not an intentional community. You know, you're born into it. Born into it. Um, you may, as uh, you may. Um, I came from the good side of the family. A very beautifully structured thing. Um, there was a leader. It was where you were taught how to cooperate, how to build with others, how to love with others, how to. Uh, you were shown how to treat others, and you knew. I don't want to say your place, but you knew your role. You were taught a role, or, or told um, how to fit in. No, speak on, preach, sister. Um, so, so these, those, so, so family has a useful place here, clearly, but it's also huge with it. Some baggage, doesn't it? Um, another metaphor that Paul used on occasion, <coughs> architectural, where we were God's co-workers working together. You were God's field, God's building. He actually mixes metaphors here, doesn't he? God's field, God's building. What Paul was thinking about that, that day. Um, this is a very little used metaphor for um, uh, by Paul. Uh, also, for me, co workers are often loosely connected. Sometimes they're close, but often they're just loosely connected. And I really only mention this. This is not this is very rarely mentioned by Paul, but I'm going to include it for completeness sake. And that brings us to um, the most important metaphor by far for Paul is the body of Christ. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Now you are the body of Christ, and individually members of it. Clearly, and certainly Paul's most uh, enduring, most important metaphor. It combines the sense we've been talking about of a, of a living thing um, and also at the same time a many structured thing, many members to the one body. Um, also note that the origin of the one body here is through baptism and the one spirit. We're going to talk about this in a moment, but this is crucially important in, in, in Paul's view of the world, Paul's vision of the church. Um, the Spirit plays a, a crucial role in the communal life of Christians. 
right, so uh, we're going to be talking primarily, as I said, about the body of Christ as presented in Corinthians. So, for the geography, where is Corinth? This is Greece. This is the Aegean Sea. This is the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, Palestine, uh, Israel will be over here somewhere. And here is Corinth. Corinth was uh, a major, major metropolitan area in the first century. Uh, it was hugely populated. It was a center of commerce. You can see it has connections uh, to the sea. Uh, it is a very, it was a very, very diverse community, diverse ethic, ethic, ethnically, culturally, and religiously. So this was an important church for Paul. Uh, now, what about 1 Corinthians? We believe it was written predictably, or, or, or uh, I think uh, we can safely say, written somewhere between 54 and 57 AD while Paul was in Ephesus. <coughs> uh, Paul established the church just a few years earlier, 50 to 52. And, and we're going to take note of that. Uh, why is he writing to the church? Why is he writing this letter first, for, uh, first Corinthians? And, and the answer is uh, a, a number of things. First of all, uh, there are divisions in the church based on loyalties. You have people, Paul says early on in the letter, you know, I hear people saying, I belong to Paul, I belong to Apollos, I belong to Cephas. Cephas is, by the way, Peter. Uh, so we've got division in the church based on uh, personality of leaders, personality of preachers, uh, a God that never happens anymore. Uh, Paul is also concerned about um, ethical behavior here. There's uh, ethics involving sex, involving lawsuits, involving eating food, particularly food sacrificed to idols. Uh, issues concerning lit liturgy and the Eucharist. And finally, there are, so we've got divisions here based on loyalties, we've got people arguing about ethical issues, and then we have people who are uh, divided based upon their perception of status. Remember, I spoke about status in the sermon not too long ago. Particularly here, uh, people were uh, claiming their particular spiritual gift is better than your spiritual gift. Mine is better than yours, and his is better than hers, and hers is better than his, and so on. And so we have issues of claim, claims of status. Um, so we have, um, we have here a church that is in disarray in large part. Now think about this. This is a church that this was established 50-52, so in, the, in as little as two years, in two to seven years, it's gone from a church that Paul has established to one that uh, appears to be in, you know, on the precipice of this ecclesia falling apart. That's pretty fast. That's pretty quick. And remember, Paul, so Paul, Paul established this church. Paul has global concern in terms of all churches, whether he established them or not, his goal is to spread the gospel at churches planted and established everywhere. But basically, this is one of his babies, right? It's one that he established. He knows these people on a first name basis. Um, and so and so his concern, concern here, as it is with many of the letters that he writes, is with the stability and integrity of the church. Um, so, what's Paul saying? Paul says, Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement, that there be no divisions among you, and that you be knit together in the same mind and same purpose. For it has been made clear to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. So, describe this what Paul says. Here's what I want. I want y'all to get along. Now, how well does that work? Y'all get along. <laughs> Did 
work too well for my mama. Uh, it, it, it just doesn't work. So the question then is, uh, how does Paul go about persuading the folks in in, uh, in Corinth to mend their ways and to get along? And he uses the body of the metaphor and blends in the note his notion of the spirit. So let's talk then, because so we have the, we have these two elements, if you will, the church as a body and the spirit. So let's talk about the spirit. Um, but you are not, but you are not in the flesh. You are in the spirit. Since the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. The spirit of him who, who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. That's in Romans. So let's take this apart for just a second. We, we have a problem. I say we, all of us, because we have a default position. When we hear spirit, what do we think about? Who said that? Say it loud. Holy, Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is part of the what? Trinity. Trinity. Happy good ghost star. You know, we think Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Trinity, the one in three, the three in one. It is part of a theology that we have ingested. It is part of our DNA. We've heard it since we, as long as we can literally remember in church, we've heard about Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Trinity. Now, explaining what that means is a whole different ball of wax, but, we get, but, but, but on, on one level, we agree that there are three in one and one in three. Well, Paul, that, that's not what Paul is talking about. Um, we've got to remember that the theology of the Trinity did not become doctrine of the church until about 325 when the Council of Nicaea met. That's why we have, how we have the Nicene Creed. What, what does the Nicene Creed tell us? It tells us what we believe about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now, the, the theology of the, uh, the Trinity was, um, was developing for a long time leading up to that, but it was this, this was not on, on Paul's radar, if you will, in, uh, in 52, 56 or 57 AD. Um, he, he, and remember, also, we talked about this the first session, Paul's not a systematic theologian in the first place. So, um, for Paul, Paul, remember, faith for Paul is not a conscious decision, it's not a rational decision. It's a way of life that springs from an authentic experience with the risen Christ. Remember, he traces this back to the Damascus Road event. And he, every, he wants everybody to have that experience. Uh, and so, and Paul sees the experience with Christ mediated through the, the, the Spirit. It's the Spirit that provides the energy, that connection between the risen Lord and us as individuals. And so, um, now, now, and so Paul, when he uses the spirit, and by the way, the word spirit, when we see it, it's translated from the, uh, from the Greek pneuma. Think of pneuma, breath. Think of the, you know, your, 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 what's, what's the, Work of the lungs, uh, it's related to pneuma as well. Anyway, it's, it's, it's related to breath. And he uses the spirit of pneuma in many ways. It's Sometimes it's God's presence and power acting among humans. It's the power that enables energy to connect to us to Jesus' resurrection. It's the presence or the indwelling of God among humans. It's the spirit of God acting here. So it's not it, it, it's not this trinitarian spirit. It is it is the force, the the energy that connects us to God, that connects us to the uh, 
to God the Son as well. Um, and the Spirit acts on the body. There are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of services, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it is the one God who activates all of them and everyone. Each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. It is the Spirit that, that infuses us with our various gifts, it infuses us with the energy and the knowledge of Jesus and of God. All right? Um, it's present in the activities of the community. To one is given through the Spirit wisdom, and to another knowledge, according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the Spirit. To another gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another working of powerful deeds. To another prophecy. To another discernment of spirits. To another various tongues. To another interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by the one and the same Spirit. Okay. So it is the spirit that is present within all the activities of the community. It is the spirit that provides the power, that's the energia in, in Greek, at work in the assembly. It's the spirit that gives the power and the, uh, and the energy to each of us as individuals and then to the, to the communal group as a whole. So it takes us back to where we started. Uh, the ecclesia is the assembly, and I talked about soteriology and ecclesiology being the same. Uh, what Paul says is it is the spirit that redeems the assembly. Through the spirit, the diverse individuals become one body that functions in harmony. Say that again. Through the Spirit, the church is one body that functions in harmony. The Spirit works for the common good. The members serve each other and build up each other without envy, without jealousy, without thought of status. And so when we view, when we view the body of Christ through that lens, this, this diverse group becoming one body with these common goals, working together, all that is bound together by the Spirit. We see that this, this idea of body of Christ is really more than a metaphor. It is in a strict sense a sign that participates in that which it signifies. This is a far cry, isn't it? From a place we go on Sunday to hang out to worship. Even though we're worshiping together. This is a vision of an assembly that worships together, that does what we did today together, <coughs> that has meals together, that works together for a common goal that puts jealousy in the status side. If we, and I'm including me, probably mostly me in this, if we can, if we can hold that vision of, of our ecclesia, our assembly, our church, if we can hold on to that and think about where that will lead us. Now, I recognize that's a lofty goal. That's a real lofty goal. Um, I started thinking about this. I mean, that's a real aspiration for the church, isn't it? Well, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. That's pretty aspirational, isn't it? I mean, I mean that's... You know, indivisible, no conflicts, liberty, justice for all. But we do aspire to it. But we got in there, no. When we get to Paul's vision, no. But wouldn't it be good to try? Wouldn't it be good to try? Any thoughts or questions? <coughs> Was that 
church able to work through the we don't know we need to return mail. <laughs> 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 well, I mean we have we have second Corinthians and we know a little bit about that. Yeah. yeah. Lynn. Okay. One thought popped into my head when you were talking about this this perfect group. And I thought, that sounds like a cult. Wow. Okay. I hope not. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what's the difference between the church and a cult? Well, I don't know. I don't, the answer to the question is I don't really know. I've never been involved in a cult and I haven't spent much time talking about it. Jody, you got an idea on that? Grace. Grace is the difference. That's my only first response yeah. to your question. Yeah. Grace is the difference between a church and a cult. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. I would say grace, which is a... I mean, tomorrow when you're walking around town and you run up to a stranger, try to explain grace to them. <laughs> yeah. But tomorrow if you're walking around town and you walk up to a stranger, give them a meal. They have then learned about grace. Okay. But defining it is hard to do. But it's kind of like we, see, we just watched Randy twist himself in knots trying to explain the spirit. <coughs> you can't do that. No. <coughs> Any more than I can explain to you the wind. I can point to it. When I, I know it when I see it. But I can't explain it to you. I can't define grace to you. I can show it to you. And then you can decide for yourself what it was and what it is. And, and that sort of thing. But the reason I say that is that the, the function of grace is to make someone gracious. That's the point of it. It's to breed itself. It's to self-perpetuate itself. And the function of grace is to make someone gracious. <clears throat> so that's why I would say it's my first answer to your question is that. I don't see a lot of that going on in what little I know about cults. I haven't seen that in what little I know about those things. Certainly there was none in Jim Jones things. That's the most famous cult I think in the round. There wasn't a lot of grace going on in that place as far as I know. I've seen it. <laughs> but, you know, that's great. Thank you, Joe. That helped a little bit? Uh-huh. Thank God we got Joe here. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't do it without all that. <laughs> Who else got some thoughts? Observations? I'm surprised you didn't ask me to throw in a kind word about predestination a while back. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, next Wednesday, Joe will be giving us a Sort of expecting that one. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, John will be talking about Calvin, my buddy, and, and predestination. Email. Uh, right. Well, thank you all for being here. And uh, we'll take this week off, but uh, two weeks from today, they say the same back time, same back station. You understand that the age is you, right? Mm -hmm. right. Go in peace and love and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks to God. God.